It has always been a dream of mine to own a large collection of books and to have a large TBR of possibilities to pull from. But while I love having a lot of books, I currently don't want to add any more bookshelves into my home, which means that these types of books that I currently have on the floor are a problem. So I somehow need to get all of these books from the floor onto my shelves, which are currently at capacity, which is where this series comes in. Throughout 2024, I'm going to be stuffing these stacks onto my shelves through any means possible. At the beginning of every episode, I will use a random number generator to select books that have to make their way to my shelves or my unhaul pile by the end of the vlog. The easiest way to start may be to read them, but if I then decide that I want to keep them, I will need to choose another book from my shelves to either read or unhaul. The episode will end when the original books chosen from the stacks and all subsequent ones pulled from shelves have made their way to either their new home on a shelf or into my unhaul pile. The stacks may change throughout the year as I organically read, unhaul and rearrange my shelves. The pool of books to choose from may change slightly as things get moved around my library or the pile could shrink with a big unhaul or even grow if I buy too many books but the overall goal remains the same by the end of 2024 the stacks have to go in episode one we scrapped three books and I'm going to be starting episode two with 77 books in the stacks <laughs> Hello my guys, welcome to episode two of Shelve It or Scrap It. You did hear right in the introduction, we are starting with more books than we ended episode one on. And I did have some questions in my comments from episode one about how I can add books to the stacks when I say in the intro that I can't. In the intro, I also say that if I hold too many books, then the stacks are potentially going to get bigger because if I don't put new books, like the shelves are at capacity and I'm not on a book buying ban, I do have a goal in place for the year to haul less books than I read, which I'm currently on track for. If I haul anything, if it can't fit on the shelves, which it can't, they're at capacity. If it doesn't go in this stack, I'm just gonna be starting a different stack somewhere else. So the books that I haul that don't go on shelves do also end up in this stack. So the main reason why we are starting with four more books than we ended episode one on is because I have just filmed my February unboxing video. So I wanna say before we get into the nitty gritty of this video, I wanna say thank you guys so much for your response to episode one. I obviously hoped that this series would be successful, that you guys would enjoy it, but I think the it, it was unprecedented the amount of attention that episode one got. So in this one, I am hoping to achieve what we did not manage to achieve in episode one, which is to actually read a book that I liked. I am 100% prepared to DNF and you guys gave me the confidence to just like DNF willy nilly if I want to in this episode. So I'm definitely prepared to do that, but my goal is to read something that I enjoy enough to get it on the shelves so that we can see how like later phases of this project might work. It also has become apparent to me that if I did one episode a month where we only get through three books. We're not going to get through this stack very successfully so hopefully through a process of reading, essentially DNFing, unhauling, reorganizing shelves, we're gonna have like a, a total higher than three books in this video but we'll see. Obviously we cannot predict what the future holds as I feel like episode one perfectly illustrated. So I have my random number generator ready to go. It is set at 77 books. Let's see if we can get rid of that strobe, shall we? Is that any better? Mm, yeah, no, the strobe isn't really much better, but let's generate our first book. Oh, wow. Is that number 67? That's gonna be like way at the bottom in this stack down here. So as before, we have a larger stack balanced on the edge of the sofa. This is book one. And then book 77, I think is the last one, is at the bottom of this Get my hair out of the way. Oh my God, this stack here. 77, 76, 75, 74, 73, 72, 71, 70, 68, 60. Instead of going from number one down to 77, I think I'm actually gonna start at 77 and count backwards. Let's get this out of the way. 77, 76, 75, 74, 73, 72, 71, 78, 69, 68, 6. Oh! <laughs> Can we not, guys? Please. 
As you can see, these stacks are highly unstable. So we may have a little bit of a rearrange for the sake of stability before we generate book two for this video. But book one is Wild is the Witch by Rachel Griffin. So this is a arc that I received in 2022. And to be honest, in 2021 and 2022, if you sent me an arc, there was like a very high possibility that it was not getting read because my mental health was in the gutter. And anything that felt like an obligation just made me want to curl in a ball and cry. So I have actually heard really good things about Rachel Griffin's first book, which I think is The Nature of Witches. And I believe that Rachel Griffin writes like contemporary witchy stories, kind of I feel in the vein of Shea Earnshaw. So this is about a girl who is a witch and because of something mysterious that happened in her past, she's vowed to never let anybody know that she's a witch ever again. So she kind of minds her own business and there's somebody on, I think it's an island potentially, a wildlife refuge that actually hates witches. And I'm assuming that it is going to turn into a romance between the two. I'm also pretty sure that this is YA, but she writes a curse that she, I don't think she intends to cast it, but it is stolen by an owl and she has to get the curse back, I think, before it curses this boy, which she never actually really intended it to do. So I, like I said, I have heard really good things about Rachel Griffin in the past, which makes me optimistic about this one. It's not one that I was like super eager to read from the stacks, but it's definitely one that I expect to enjoy. So I feel like we're, fingers crossed, off to a good start already. This lighting is feeling super ominous, but I've just done a live show with my patrons and I'm gonna go watch a couple of episodes of Love is Blind season six, which I'm only five episodes in so far. I've heard that this season is crazy, but I haven't really seen anything for myself yet. So I'm really excited, but I am going to check in with you already because I have made a decent dent in this. I'm 108 pages in, which is over a third of the way through. I have been sick over the last week and I'm still not fully recovered. So I haven't been working out, which means that in the time that I would be working out or like walking Brie or something, I've been reading instead, which is probably how I've made it so far, but it's okay so far. I'm enjoying it. It's not like I dislike it to the point where I want to DNF it or anything. I do feel like I know how this story is going to play out. I feel like it is quite predictable in that way. The writing is a little bit melodramatic, but it's not like unbearable or anything. But this one is following a girl who is a witch. And in the prologue, we find out what happens that makes her want to keep the fact that she's a witch a secret. So she is camping with her best friend and her best friend turns her boyfriend into a witch, which oh, that's a lot of witches. It's illegal because people who are newly turned into witches are unpredictable. So this boy turns into a witch and he draws all of the magic into himself and essentially like spontaneously combusts. Although not that spontaneously, I guess, because like he pulled the magic in. But anyway, since then she's obviously had a great deal of trauma and she now doesn't want anybody to know that she's a witch. So herself and her mother moved to the Pacific Northwest and opened an animal refuge. There she is working with this boy who is an intern. He's, is it ornithology that specializes in birds? And honestly, he's a dick and it's going to be a romance between them. And it's going to be like, he actually likes her. The fact that he's like not liking her isn't serious. Essentially, he just pisses her off a little bit too much one day. So she does this thing where like she writes curses, but then burns them. And it kind of like, it's like having a diary, like it exercises all of the negative feelings out of her. But just as she's about to like get rid of this curse, a owl like swoops down that's like been following her around and absorbs the curse. So then she has to go and find the owl because apparently the way that magic works is that if it is bound to something living, it will stay with that living creature up until the creature's death when the curse will then continue on its way to its intended target, which is this boy that she works with. So she tells her mother that she's going to look for this bird because it's escaped from the refuge. And her mother's like, yeah, sure, but you can't go by yourself and tells her that she has to take this boy with her. So with this being tied to her best friend, my prediction is that the, well, I don't know what the specifics of the owl is going to be, but I feel like the owl is some sort of like guardian or sign. It's already been established that like it's magically gifted that absorbed the curse on purpose to bring her and this boy closer together to like force them on this journey off into the forest to find the owl that is going to bring them closer together. Now I'm 100 pages in and they are already on their journey to find the owl. So I'm wondering like what the next 200 pages is gonna be because with the speed that we have got to this forest, I don't know how much can be derailed in the forest to fill like 200 pages. I mean, I'm sure I'm gonna find out. It's just, I felt like it was proceeding quite rapidly at the beginning with like what I assumed like the rest of the story was going to entail. So yeah, I'm having a, a decent time with it. I haven't fallen in love with it or anything, but I, I like it. She goes back in a bit, so we didn't actually manage to finish it. 
to finish it. So we didn't actually manage to finish. Turn it low in that coming way. Thank you so much for joining me. 80 to 90 on our cadence. Resistance. Before we get into this, I just want to give a shout out to one of my patrons, Ash, who is one of the most thoughtful people and is also the kind of person that sends you like pointless little things to make your day. And the most recent thing I've received from Ash is this super cute positive potato. I did sprints with my patrons the other day. We had a 24 hour readathon and it was when I was at my sickest. And there's just like something going around at the minute, guys, because everybody in those sprints was also sick. So this was like a thank you for hosting the sickathon. <laughs> sprints it was truly a rough time but we got through it together this is just so cute as well thank you so much ash some of the other like pointless things that make my day that ash has sent me include i don't know if you guys have seen this like it's just generally always in the background but like it's obviously in the distance but it's a spoon with taylor swift's face on also one of my most prized possessions put the positive potato in the tissue box where he belongs i'm actually feeling rather accomplished because i have already finished our first book for this video which is of course wild is the witch by rachel griffin and i really 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 enjoyed this. I wouldn't consider it to be a fantasy romance in the typical sense of the word but it is definitely a fantasy story that has a very dominant romance running through it. Like the romance and the relationship between these two characters is the main focus point of this book I would say. It was exactly as predictable as I expected it to be. It did continue to be extremely dramatic in a way that pretty much only teenagers can be and I wouldn't say that the plot was the best because with it being pretty predictable it was also quite contrived in its predictability in parts where some of the things that were going on were just kind of like super obvious and a little bit eye-rolly. That being said I really enjoyed this and I gave it a low four star rating and I think for a YA like fantasy romance it's real good. Like you know I have not been feeling romance recently in any way shape or form. I really really liked this one and I think that if I'd have read this like 10 years ago I would have given it five out of five stars and loved it and that obviously isn't to say that it doesn't have its issues because as I just mentioned there are definitely things that I don't love about this or definitely things that like I could see through or see coming a million miles away but I had a really good time with it so I am very happy to say I could unhaul this book for sure like I could just be like I've read it I'm done like I never need to see it again and that is still like kind of valid but I am actually going to keep this one because there's just something about it. Like I said it wasn't the best book I ever read and it wasn't like super impactful to me but I had a, such a good time that I'm keeping this one which means that we are heading over to the shelves but actually um, something I noticed because obviously when I knew that this was the book that I was going to be reading I knew where on my shelves this would go if I chose to keep it. There's a gap there. I don't know why. It is very clear that a book has been taken out of there and has hasn't been put back but I cannot for the life of me figure out like there's nothing on my TBR or in my wrap up that should be in that gap and I think I know what book has come out of it and it's a book that I've been hovering on unhauling for a while I guess I'll take you over to the shelves and we'll talk about it there because I don't know why I've taken this book off my shelves I have no recollection of doing it but I guess that means I'm gonna unhaul it anyway we'll well let's just go over there this this is Carnage. All of the Throne of Glass characters are hanging on here for dear life. The fishing wire that I have across has kind of unraveled from the pin and I really need to fix that. But if I'm being honest, I was away for two weeks. I went to four gigs and then I was sick for a week. And if I'm looking around this room, there's a lot of things that I really need to get on top of, this being one of them. But the gap in question is right here, which my shelves, I'm sure you've noticed in the past, it is alphabetical order by author. And then as you, like as my library's expanded and more shelves have been added, it gets a little bit chaotic because I don't have the space to have everything organized as I would. Literally, if it was up to me, I would have everything just in alphabetical order in like one wall of shelves. But when I moved, I did explain this and I have mentioned it before in the past, like every large wall in my house has a massive radiator on it, which stops me from putting big furniture along the wall and it is the bane of my existence in every single room in this house but I cannot be bothered paying for and I do not have the knowledge and the skill to move all of my radiators myself so we just live with it but we complain about it a lot but here is the gap okay and it's after John Green so Rachel Griffin would slot in perfectly here but the book that I think has come out of there is Water for Elephants by Sarah Gruen. This is a book that I read way before booktube. The start of my book collection was actually books and movie adaptations and that is 
because I was a film study student when I was in college and I loved it and I always loved reading so I really liked to read books and then see how they had been translated into film. So this is from like when I first started building my collection which to be honest is when I was 18-ish and it was through thrifting because through my childhood like I was very very poor growing up. I only had a very small collection of books and I used to utilize my library and like check out 12 books a week, read them, go back and check out 12 more. So my collection only really started building when I was 18. Now if you go on Goodreads, I have given this book five stars and because of that I will not unhaul it but I couldn't tell you a single thing about this. I couldn't even tell you if I actually enjoyed this book or if I just read it when I was 19 thought it was decent and was like yeah cool five stars. So I don't remember taking this off my shelf but the other day I found it in my unhaul pile. I don't know whether it's kind of made its way there because I've forgotten why I've taken it off and assumed that I've unhauled it because I do keep dithering backwards and forwards on it but surprisingly now that it's in there and I've accepted that it's in there I'm no longer dithering about it like I'm unhauling this book and that's the problem with me it's like the decision to put things in the unhaul pile is actually worse than putting them in there because I have maybe accidentally put that in my unhaul pile but now that it's there it's committed to be an unhauled decision has been made which means that this one's a real easy one because Wild is the Witch is just gonna slot right in there and actually we have a gap so this one is another arc another Rachel Griffin arc that was sent to me by Sourcebooks this one was for 2023 I think it took like a while to arrive or it arrived after its release date so I didn't end up reading it I'm obviously very interested in reading this now that I've read and really enjoyed Wild as the Witch but I'm pretty sure a Oh wait, alphabetical? Yeah, alphabetical order, so this one will go first. And that shelf is now once again at capacity, so that means that we have a gap over here. So I just got Bring Me Up Midnight from here, which is the second tier of one of my TBR carts. The top tier here is my, so at the minute I haven't filled my wrap up, so up to here is my January wrap up. No, February wrap up, and that is my March TBR. So a little bit further down, I will be honest, the bottom of this is just overspill. When I first got this car, it was intended to be like my recent haul, um, like wrap up and TBR on top. But I obviously like have no space, so it's just been filled up. So from here, and on the bottom shelf, just overspill of books. These are arcs that I have been sent <laughs> that I have not got to. So it's kind of like a priority TBR, but being honest, do I ever prioritize them? Have I picked any of these books up since they've been here in my priority section? No. I haven't. So we now have a gap here somewhere, which if I could find an arc to fit in, that would fit the theme. But otherwise, it's just a book that will fit in that slot. If I'm being maybe small, hardback could go. We'll see what we've got in the stacks. Pretty sure that I don't have any arcs in these stacks or anything maybe that's been sent to me by the publisher. I'm pretty sure they're all regular books. So that means that we should be looking for a, oops, <laughs> a small hardback and not a romance one because my romance books belong upstairs even though those shelves of course like the rest of them are also full so i'm actually going to go with it's quite a slim spot because a paperback came out of it i'm going to put in a thousand pieces of you but actually am i because realistically shelving them potentially removes them from this challenge and this is a book that i feel like i'm going to read and unhaul like i feel like this would be a good one for me to just finally read i've had it for literally years maybe since it was released in like 2016 2014 so yeah i've had it since maybe 2015 60 in a long time so maybe a newer book where's my other copy of study in Vernon? oh i think i took it upstairs i stand by it we are going to put a thousand pieces of you in and then if the opportunity oh, but i'm never going to be shelving things from the cart because the cart is all tbr books so i'm never gonna shelve something over that oh why is this so hard okay we'll go for i guess a newer book that is yeah oh ham i'm gonna put a smaller hardback in if this one will fit also a much newer book this one was a pretty recent Illumicrate book so I feel like this one deserves to sit on my shelves for a few years whereas a thousand pieces of you has already had that opportunity <laughs> Finally, I managed to illustrate different ways in which we can get the books from the stacks to the shelves. And this is why I said at the beginning of the first video, like I don't know what the rules, the exact rules and parameters are for this challenge to be able to explain to you guys, because it's very much conditional based on how each book resolves. So with that one, I only read I wanted to keep one book but because we created a gap somewhere else because for some reason I'd made a gap in my shelves already we managed to get two books total from the stacks 
onto the shelves with me only having to read one. So now we are going to pick our second book. We were on 77, but because we've shelved two, we now have 75. So let's see what book two is gonna be. That is number 56. I feel like 56. I'm gonna have to count from the beginning just to make sure because I can't rely on myself to count backwards from 75 that reliably. Let's go. I'm anticipating it being somewhere like around the middle of this stack here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 40. I'm scared. 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56. Oh, this is the. Mm. We definitely need to do some work on these. I still haven't fixed the structure. So, number 56 is Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi. So this is a book that I bought brand new from Waterstones in the year that it was released, which was 2016, 2018. So it's more recent than I thought that it was. It's the Waterstones exclusive with the red sprayed edges. It was very, very hyped at the time of me buying this and I was relatively new to booktube. So I was in that phase of buying everything that like everybody was talking about. And this has languished on my shelves since then. The only reason it's come off and into the stacks is because I've started reading Jo Abercrombie because I'm hosting First Laura Long. And so as that collection has grown, it's pushed a lot of things off the top shelf of my books. So this, I don't remember. I don't think I remember what this was about. The back just says, they killed my mother, they took our magic, they tried to bury us, now we rise. Okay, so this is about a kingdom that was full of magic and then there was a ruthless king that decided that everybody that had magic should die, including the main character, Zele's mother. Now anybody that has magic, there's still a few people left, but they have to remain hidden. And it says that the main character, Zele, has the chance to bring back magic to her people and strike against the monarchy. Very typical YA fantasy synopsis of its time. I have heard really good things about book one, not so many great things about the sequel. So I feel like I'm potentially going to be bearing that in mind as I'm reading it. Has book three for this even been released yet as well? I feel like it has had a very slow publishing schedule for a YA series and that is why potentially a lot of people's interest has waned because they've had to wait so long for the sequels, then I don't really hear anybody talk about this series at all anymore. I am definitely excited to read it based on how hyped it was back in the day and to finally get around to it. And I do hope it's one of those YA series like The Demon King that I started recently and really loved that really is one of the quality installments in like YA fantasy of its time. So today I'm actually going to be doing some more work on our bedroom. We are going to be taking all the pins out of the coven that we put up in the last vlog. If you guys are interested in the whole renovation process, don't worry if you're missing installments of my regular vlogs because what I'm actually doing is saving all of the renovation clips to eventually make like a full transformation video at the end. That is the plan. I've never made a video like that before, so we'll see how it comes together. But today we are taking the pins that was holding the coving up, hoping that the adhesive is going to hold the coving up because actually last night we were looking at like tips and videos on, on sealing the coving and filling in gaps. And we actually discovered that the adhesive that we've used has a very low rating, like review rating on the B&Q website. So now we're a little bit worried about taking those pins off in case all of the coven falls off. Now it does seem that the people who cannot use who are rating the adhesive badly are not using pins to hold it in place, which I think is a very common practice when putting up coven. So I feel like it's their mistake rather than the quality of the adhesive. But we're gonna take all of those pins out, hopefully fill all of the gaps, seal all of the edges, sand any remaining bits of adhesive off the surface of the coven and also any lumps and bumps we have in the mist coat or any adhesive that's got on the wall or the ceiling because I have actually ordered paint. I ordered it on Thursday from Pharaoh and Ball. It should be arriving I think on Monday and depending on how next week goes I'll either be starting to paint next week or next weekend. So very excited that things are actually moving and coming together with that now but my plan Curtis is starting because he's going to do most of the ceiling. I'm just going to be on like touch-ups and support, which is unusual actually, because I'm the handy person in our relationship most of the time. But I'm gonna, I think, take Brie for a walk and then head up there and get cracking on that. And I also have a live show this evening as well. So I'm not sure how much of a dent that I will make in this today. I'm hoping that with it being YA, it is going to be a relatively quick read and also pretty compelling. So we'll see. Seems to hold me like you do. Mm -hmm. 
You're so wonderful. A star could never shine as bright as you. Mm. Even the dark, they still see light. Even the birds still sing at night. Every word just comes out right when I'm with you, with you. I feel so lucky I met you, and I still mm, can't believe that I get to see those eyes from more than tonight. I swear you must have fell from the sky, and I feel mm, so lucky I met you. It's not logical the way I feel when you walk in the room. So I do appreciate that I look a little bit unhinged right now, but in my defense, it is Sunday. And if you do not look like a hot slob on a Sunday, then my guy, you are simply doing Sundays wrong. <laughs> but I'm trying heatless curls for the first time because it is the first time I'm using my dressing gown card. I don't have like the actual rod that people are using, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm sure that I will report back tomorrow at some point. And I am filming tomorrow. So fingers crossed, like it does turn out well but I have read a significant chunk of children of blood and bone and I'm having a really really good time with this I'm 152 pages into it it is quite a chunky one it's like 525 pages but I need to dnf books when I know that like they're just not going to get any better and I know I say this all the time but I picked up this book and I started it and immediately in the first chapter I was like okay I like the writing style and I feel like a lot of books that I read or a lot of books I have read have a very plain bland writing writing style that just really isn't doing it for me and then sometimes I think that I'm the problem but it's not me and I only realize that it isn't me when I pick up a book like this where I'm immediately engaged by the text and I feel like that's something that's really important to me and my enjoyment of a book because I feel like if it doesn't have that level of engagement then I'm just gonna start to or stop paying attention while I'm reading it. But this one is thankfully not doing that. This is doing the direct opposite. So this one is multi-perspective. At the moment, we are following three perspectives. One is Zaley and her mother was murdered at the time that magic left the world. I think it was, was it 16 years prior to the start of the story. And the king decided that he was going to remove magic users once and for all. Something happened to the magic, it stopped working. And the king took advantage of this situation and killed anybody who had the ability to wield magic. So people with the potential to wield magic are still born. Zele, our main character, is one of those and they are identified by their white hair. However, because there are no gods in the world anymore, like that's the reason why they think that magic died, they don't actually end up being able to wield magic. They would just born with the ability if they were to live in a world where magic still existed, which they currently don't. So because of the everything that happened with the magic wielders being killed, the people who have the potential to wield magic are facing extreme prejudice and the king is continuing to raise the amount of taxes that these diviners, is what they're called, have to pay, essentially just to oppress them. That is our first main character. Our second is Amari and Amari is a princess who is very close to her handmaid and we are introduced to her perspective where she is having I think breakfast with her mother and she finds out that her handmaid has been summoned by the king so she goes to kind of find her and sees her father kill her because some artifacts have washed up on the shore of this country and when people are coming into contact with them they are able to use their magic again so they use this girl as a test subject to illustrate to the king what is going on he kills her immediately and Amari steals one of these artifacts and runs off with it. While she is in pursuit of this, she runs into Zele and essentially begs her to help her get out of the city because the Royal Guard have been sent after her, more for the artifact that she carries than her herself. Like a lot of the like nobility don't know that it was the princess that stole the item, the Royal Guard don't know, but they have been tasked with hunting down the item. So Zele can't help herself, she has to help somebody in need, so they manage to escape, head back to Zele's village, and they are sent on a mission by somebody who does have the ability to channel magic to try and restore magic to the world. Now our third perspective is Amari's brother, who is the prince, and he is also, as well as being the prince, he's kind of like the captain of the royal guard, and his father, after finding out that it was Amari that stole the artifact, sends his son, I think is he called Inan? Yeah, to find Amari so that nobody else discovers that it is the princess that has run away with this artifact, and kind of find it all 
all costs. So he sets off in pursuit of the two girls. But what he is struggling with is the fact that he does seem to be able to channel magic, but in a little bit of an unusual way. He doesn't quite have the white hair that is the normal tell of the diviners, but he is struggling with a magical ability to some degree. So I'm having a really good time with it. I did go on Goodreads and like scroll through some reviews because like I said, I do know that the second book in the series is rated significantly less than this one. So I guess my plan in that regard is that if I continue to enjoy this one, the third book is released this year. So I'm going to wait and see what the general opinion is on book three. And if it's generally regarded like higher than book two is, then I'll continue on with the series because I can handle like a disappointing book two, but I can't handle a stellar book one. And then the next two books just like steadily declining. I'm looking at you, Crescent City. I'm still mad about that. And while I was scrolling through Goodreads, actually, I did see a few people whose opinions I generally trust. Um, saying that they didn't love this one. So I'm shocked because I'm having a real good time so far. It's reminded me a lot of when I started We Hunt the Flame by Hafsa Faisal. Also kind of a little bit of Ember in the Ashes and with some of the themes that we have going on here and the characters, I'm getting like glimmers of The Final Strife by Sarah Elarifi as well, which are all books and series I really loved. So it's looking good for Children of Blood and Bone. It is just sad though, because just knowing how many people dislike the sequel, I'm not going to let that kind of colour my opinion of this book, but it is kind of demotivating, you know, because if so many people are saying that, I don't feel like I'm going to be the special snowflake exception that loves it. I mean, I might be, but it's unlikely, you know? Okay, it's time for the moment of truth, the grand reveal. I did also do Curtis's last night with his dressing gown card and I wrapped it a different way but I've just unwrapped his and they look really good so I'm feeling optimistic because mine have been in for like quite a few hours more than his have but I wrapped mine this was more like a braid I would say whereas I did his a standard way where you just kind of like wrap it around mine has stayed in a little bit better than his did as well but let's get the scrunchies out I'm excited if this goes horribly wrong I guess we don't film today we edit instead because that is also an option This is good, man. If I curl my hair with heat, like if I use a curling iron, it doesn't stay in anymore. It used to when I was like in my early 20s, I used to wash my hair like every three days and then I would curl it and it would stay in, like the curls would stay for three days. But now, oh, that was not a good idea. The only way that I can get my hair to stay any kind of curly is if I braid it and then sleep in it. If I, if I braid it dry, I normally have to keep the braids in for two days. And if I braid it damp, then I can do it the morning after. It's looking good. There we go. So this is where I've just pulled the cord through and I've kind of tangled up all my hair. Right. We do have a bit of frizz. Oh. <laughs> There's a bit of frizz where those um, tangles were. But otherwise, I'm real happy with this. I love having big hair. So this is great. I might need to tame it down a little bit before I film, but I'm happy with the results. So I just wanted to bring you guys a little bit of an update on my upcoming Trover trip to Crete, which is a Greek island this coming October. So if you're new here, hello. I host group trips with Trover trip from time to time. I've been on three so far. The first one I went on was as a guest and then I hosted one to Rome and Florence last September and I've just recently been on one to Thailand this February. My next one is a relaxing reading retreat in Crete due to start on the 6th of October. It is a seven day group trip. We have like, we're visiting the ruins where like the Minotaur legend was born. There are beach visits on there. There is like a guided tour of one of the towns that we're visiting as well as a archeological museum and a waterfall visit are like the main things on the itinerary. So typically in the past, my group trips have confirmed within a month at the latest. And I'm still really excited to go to Greece and I have four wonderful people who are along for the ride with me. But this trip in particular needs 10 people to confirm. Like I said, we normally confirm within a month and this one has been a little bit slower. So I don't know whether it's because the timing's off. I know a couple of people have reached out to me and wanted to come, but a lot of 
people apparently are having destination weddings in October, which is super exciting for them. However, I don't know whether the itinerary isn't speaking to people. I don't know whether y'all aren't that interested in going to Greece, but I do have a lot of people who are very, very excited for me to start planning a trip for next year. And I do definitely have something in mind, something already in the works that will be coming up in the coming months. But that does not solve the problem of Greece. So there are, in theory, there's plenty of time until Greece happens. The typical Trova trip deadline is two months before the trip starts. But I kind of want to know what I'm doing. I have people from the US booked on this trip. When it's long haul, you want to book your flights in advance. And so after speaking to my Trova trip rep, we have decided to give people a deadline to show their interest in this trip. So at the minute, if this trip has not confirmed or there is not like more interest, more people wanting to go to Greece by the end of this month, March 31st, then we're going to cancel the trip, which is fine for me. I still really want to go to Greece. I'm still really excited about this itinerary, but if it is cancelled, like it's the end of the world. It's not the end of my Trova trip journey. I have, I'm definitely going to be hosting more Trova trips in the future, but it's just about gauging interest and also making sure that people have the time to put the preparations like book their flights and stuff in advance if they do want to come so if you are interested or if there's anything holding you back from booking this trip head to my instagram link in description as always send me a dm let me know what it is that is holding you back if it's something like anxiety or if there's something in particular you're unsure about that i can help you with hop into my dms let me know i will answer any questions and then aside from that like if if we don't go we don't go it's fine it's fine but i would love to and i know that the four people who are already booked on obviously would also love to so yeah that's all i have to say i just wanted to bring you guys an update to let you know that there is a new deadline in place if you are interested as always i know that not everybody can take me up on the opportunity to come along on a group trip i honestly think they're a great time but i just want to thank everybody who supports me in this and doesn't mind when i do bring it up occasionally but yeah i'm gonna go and get some lunch now and head to tesco and maybe get some reading in for the rest of the day because i've done everything oh no, I need to make some thumbnails and schedule some stuff actually. Even the dark, they still see light. Even the birds still sing at night. Every word just comes out right when I'm with you, with you. I feel so lucky I met you. Good morning, guys. As y'all can see, the curls are still with us. They were a little bit flat this morning, so I had to zhuzh them up with a bit of dry shampoo. And it actually reminded me, like, I have curly hair naturally, and I have a keratin treatment which smooths it out and kind of, like, removes the curl from it. And I remembered why this morning, because curls are tangly, and, like, my curls specifically, they're only curly for a day, and then they go flat. I also have very fine strands of hair, but I have a lot of them because my hair is very thick. So my hair is prone to tangling and knotting. So having it curly isn't great because you're not really supposed to brush your hair when you have curly hair. And if I didn't do that, then it, it mats at the back of my neck. So yeah, I remembered why I don't do curls anymore really, but I am happy with how it turned out. And I think I'm gonna do this in the future. Maybe not every time I wash my hair, but from time to time, because I feel like we've got a decent curl. It could do with touching up, but I mean, it's fine. It's not that deep. But the main reason why I'm here is actually to give you a little bit of a reading up Day because I'm going to be hosting public sprints today. It's 9.30. I have public sprints starting at 10 for Realmathon and I do think I'm going to end up finishing Children of Blood and Bone today. The last time I spoke about this book I told you like a bunch of series it really reminded me of and the more I'm reading it the more I kind of stand by that but I know specifically why it reminds me of each series that I mentioned now. So the final strife is one that I said it's like thematically reminds me of but actually what it is is that we have two very similar characters in here to the main characters in the final strife so we have is it sila and Anor in The Final Strife. And in here we have Zele and Amari. Now, both of these books have a character who is a peasant like from the lower classes and a princess who doesn't agree with like the way, of, she's not quite a princess in The Final Strife, but she is like a member of the high up nobility and she doesn't quite agree with the way that the country is run, faces some like emotional abuse from her parents and is pushed into joining like a rebellion or fighting against her family and the government government for the sake of the country. And then <laughs> Zelie is very much like Sila because they are both impulsive, like act now, think later, easy to anger 
characters. I also said that this reminds me a little bit of We Hunt the Flame and An Ember in the Ashes and it is the main character of Inan in here it is reminding me of those series especially because We Hunt the Flame is about the Sultan's son who is sent to follow the Huntress as she's on a mission and here we have like Inan following behind Amari and Zele like trying to catch up with them to I mean essentially kill them and then in terms of Ember in the Ashes Inan is reminding me of is it Elias in Ember in the Ashes? It's been a couple of years since I read that series and I read it all in a week so it occupied like a very short time of my life but they're both like commanders like the sons of important people and like the commanders of the guard so definitely giving me good vibes in all of that regard but I have not been loving it as much through the middle as I was at the beginning I do still really like the writing style which is what is keeping me hooked like I'm 351 pages into this so my pace is not slowed at all I'm reading like 100 to 150 pages a day which is very good for me considering this actually isn't the only book that I'm reading but I do think that it's lost my full absorption a little bit throughout the middle more to do with the plot and the characters than anything else the writing style is still very much carrying me through I think the the characters can be a little bit one-dimensional we have Amari whose only real purpose is to avenge her handmaiden like that's the reason the thing that pushed her to escape in stealing this artifact fact and like finding Zele. It was such a minor part of the book. It's kind of like, well to a greater extent, it's like Darrow and Eo in Red Rising where that one event is the driving motivation for the majority of this character's actions. But in terms of the reader, it occupied like such a small part of the story and Eo is in Red Rising way more than Binta is in this book that like it gets a little bit tedious because we have no attachment to this character that the main character is constantly thinking about and pining over. Zelie is super impulsive, that's all I can really say about her. But then Anan, I feel like I like the way that his character arc is going, but I feel like it was a bit quick. Like I feel like it was almost like a switch flipped for him as opposed to like a gradual progression towards like where his character is at this moment that I'm reading. That I feel like it was a little convenient. I didn't see see it like I saw it coming because of the hints of like shall we say connections that he potentially has to other characters but I don't feel like his character made any kind of realistic shift I feel like it was very abrupt which is all I can really say without spoilers so I guess whether I keep this whether I want to continue on with the series is very much going to hinge on the end so I feel like if this has enough to intrigue me about a sequel I'm going to want to keep it and continue but if it ends in like a very wrapped up manner I could see myself being very happy just like reading this and not continuing the series especially knowing that a lot of people don't really love book two and book three is currently not published so we don't know the verdict on the series as a whole. So during sprints I did manage to finish Children of Blood and Bone as planned and I'm very torn about what to do about this one because at the minute it's teetering between a high three star and a low four star and I think that my issue is that I am struggling to reconcile my feelings on this because I think that it started stronger than it ended. So the first 200 pages of this book gave me so much hope and promise that I was going to love this that wasn't quite fulfilled in the latter stages of this book and it, it wasn't bad like the end of this book wasn't bad but as I mentioned in my last update I did feel like the characters motivations weren't 100% believable the further we went in I felt like big snap decisions were happening a little bit faster than would be realistic and so they seemed not necessarily that they were coming out of nowhere but more that they were convenient in the moment because the depth and development leading up to such decisions kind of like wasn't there and I feel it didn't feel rushed necessarily in terms of the plot. I think it was the character motivations and development that felt a little bit rushed matching up with the things that they were doing as they were interacting with the plot, if that makes any sense at all. The writing style did continue to be compelling throughout and because of that I breezed through this. Like it's a 500 page book and I read it across like pretty much across three days. So it definitely hooked me in and I feel like that's also one of the reasons why I'm struggling to know what to do with this because I, it's so rare for me to find a book that's so promising at the beginning. It's like when you read a disappointing sequel 
people like the part of you that loves the first book is expecting the next books to be phenomenal and when it isn't you kind of gaslight yourself a little bit into believing that it is and I do kind of feel like that's what's happening to me right now. I am really glad though that I finished this book in sprints because I had the opportunity to ask everyone because obviously this was like super hyped when it was released like what they thought about book two, why it was disappointing, whether they think I should continue and actually the general consensus, the overwhelming result was that a lot of people don't think it's worth continuing this series but I did say that I wanted to kind of see what the general reception was for book three when that was published. I have done a little bit of research into book three as well and the second book in the series is like 415 pages so over 100 pages shorter and then book three if the information on Amazon is reliable which it isn't published for a couple of months so I can't say that it is but if it is then book three is going to be about 365 pages which is shorter again which normally for me when the sequels to a book are smaller with each installment in a fantasy series it does throw up some red flags so I think that I don't know what to do. I liked this story, I liked the plot, I liked the characters and if it wasn't for the two page epilogue at the end of this I think I would have been very happy being like okay this ends in a way where I'm happy to put it down but the last two pages kind of just essentially implies that something happened at the end. You know what actually no that doesn't apply anymore because I looked up the synopsis for book two and that tells me what the result of the end of this book is because it's kind of like one of the characters doesn't know exactly what's happened at the end and something happens that kind of gives us a clue but we don't know for sure and then if you read the synopsis of book two it kind of gives you a little bit more detail on that so I feel like I'm satisfied on that front. The problem is is that if I put this on my shelves I'm potentially just going to unhaul it in June when the third book is released and potentially people don't enjoy it. So I would only be keeping it to kind of see, like I didn't, to see whether it's worth continuing. If I had book two right now, would I be desperate to pick it up? No. Am I gonna buy book two? Also no. I did really like the world building in here and I do think that Tomi Adeyemi does a good job of like having a complex magic system and a complex world for like a YA fantasy and I think that is also that super important to me so I feel like that also pulled me in but do I want to keep it? I think I'm happy because I think that while I enjoyed a lot about this I think that the execution could have been better and had the execution been better I would definitely be continuing with the series or definitely be hanging on for book three. Okay, I know what we're gonna do. If we were to shelve this now, if we were to proceed as we should right now, then we would be trying to get this on my shelf and I would be picking something from the shelf to read so that I can get this on there, maybe on and on until infinity, depending on the results of that. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit on this until the end of this video. I'm going to put it in my own haul pile because that's what I think that I want to do. and. If after we've resolved the next book, book three for this video, I still have an issue with this being in my own haul pile, then we will shelve it and see what happens. But for now, this one's an unhaul and we'll we'll see. This is like why I do the self-destructing books thing because what I think is gonna happen is that if I say I'll put it in my unhaul pile for now, given 24 hours, I won't care about unhauling it and I won't want to continue. It's just coming to terms with that being a, a definite, like I hate making decisions. So we'll revisit this soon. <laughs> Which means it's time to pick book three. So we're now at 74 books. Let's generate. 66, why are they all so high? So we have 74, 73, 72, 71, 70, 69, 68, 67, 66, which is Princess of Souls by Alexandra Christo. So last time I'm pretty sure that we didn't generate anything higher than like 40 or 50. So we were in like the first half of the stack. And this time we're in like the last 20 numbers. This one was number I think 66. And the last one was in the 50s. The other one was in the 60s. So not only are we only generating high numbers, we're also apparently only reading paperbacks and specifically YA fantasy paperbacks because this one is Princess of Souls by Alexandra Christo. This is one that I would, can't lie, I would be happy to DNF it if I'm being honest and unhaul it. It's one that I'm very much unsure about, one that I have no desire to read, but I've hung on to it so that I can give it a try because like you literally never know. I know nothing about this book. I haven't really heard anyone talk about this book. It could be my next five star 
if only I would give it a try and that is why I do keep books around to give them a try before I unhaul them. The reason that I actually have this one is because it was the bonus paperback that was included in a fairy loot box from 2020. Two. So it is a couple of years old now. I have the majority or actually all of the extra paperbacks that have been sent in fairy loot boxes or Illumicrate boxes, I have yet to read. So they're all very much like I think younger YA for the most part, which generally doesn't speak to me. But like I said, this one could be my next five star. The thing that I really like about the publisher of this, which is Hotkey Books actually, is that they have like a little buzzword thing on the back of like what's in the book. And for this one, it says curses, fate, romance, and death. Oh, it's by the author of To Kill a Kingdom. That's why she sounds familiar. Okay. Okay, so it's about a girl who has powerful magic and has been locked in a tower by a king and a boy who is trying to kill the king and the king's entire court, which also means killing this girl. I am obviously assuming that it is going to turn into a romance between them because that tends to be how these things go. I'm going into it open-minded, but I haven't heard anything about this. And while the synopsis sounds fine, it isn't like screaming at me in any way. So we'll see how it goes. So I need to get some audiobook time in for a different book that I'm reading because my Spotify premium renews this evening and I want to make the most of the available hours I have left before it renews because I think I'm going to get through quite a few audiobooks this month. But I wanted to show you that I finished this puzzle. This is my last 500 piece one that I have left. I did do this one pretty quickly because of that. I have one 636 piece left and then I only have 1000 to go. So hopefully the pace of complete and puzzles is going to be slowing down a little bit but I'm gonna put this one away now and start this one which oh my god I remember when all of the Winnie the Pooh stuff in Argos you had like cross stitches and knit your own characters but they all had this purple bee background and font so I'm really excited to get into this one while I'm gonna start it now while I'm waiting for dinner and get a little bit of audiobook time in just to make the most of the money I'm paying for Spotify because it's a lot. So I'm gonna be honest I don't want to read this book and I'm not even that far into it. I'm 20, I've just took my bookmark out. I'm 27 pages into it. I've literally just read this, but since this came up yesterday, I have had absolutely no desire to read. The only reason I've got through 27 pages is because I've been reading a chapter while I've been exporting the videos that I've been editing today and it's fine. I have no draw to it. I have nothing really negative to say about it. I just don't want to read it. Like I did say when we picked it, like I'm happy to DNF this it's not something I'm interested in it's just something that I've acquired um I did look it up on Goodreads and I have found out a couple of things about it that I did not know the first thing is that this is technically a sequel I think it's a sequel in a series of standalones this is actually the sequel to To Kill a Kingdom which is a standalone Little Mermaid sea witch retelling and this one is a Rapunzel retelling about a girl who is an apprentice witch her mother is like the royal witch and every year or so they have like a hundred, two hundred people come to the palace to the royal palace and get a prediction from the witches and then if they can't like avert the prediction in some way the king eats their souls to keep him immortal and the male main character in here is a guy who has come to the palace as one of these prediction seekers to kill the king very kind of basic YA synopsis very kind of typical YA writing style in here not in a bad way at all I just have very very little interest in this and so in the nature of this I feel like, you know, like when you put a poll up and because you can't make a decision and then when the winner comes in, like you don't want to do it, like you don't want to go with the winning one, you know then that that is a wrong choice for you to make because there's something telling you not to do it. Something just does not want me to read this book so I'm happy to put it down. Like I said I'm a never say never kind of person. I want to kind of give everything a try especially if I have the opportunity to if I already have it. This I just don't want to read it and that's okay. It was like an extra paperback that came in a fairy loot. It's not like I wanted to read it at any point and I bought it wanting to read it. I was pretty lukewarm about it when it arrived and I still don't want to read it now. I think as well with To Kill a Kingdom being Alexandra Christo's most popular book. I have no desire to read that either and so reading a like lesser known sequel is not really high up on my list of priorities and so um, we're gonna go back and we're gonna pick a what mm, I haven't conclusively decided what I'm doing with Children of Blood and Bone yet. I think my gut is telling me I don't need it and my brain is telling me oh but what if so I think in that regard 
we're gonna leave it again and we're gonna go back to the stacks and pick a fourth book. Okay, we're down to 73 books now. Let's generate. Number 40, okay. So I think 40 is gonna be either right at the bottom of here or in this stack. So, Ooh, 40. I am hyped about this one, guys. So this one is super exciting, but also a little bit of a change of pace because we have Ace of Spades by Farida BK Ayamide. And this one I remember had a ton of buzz in 2021, which is why I wanted to read it. And this one was also gifted to me by Caitlin. So thank you very much to Caitlin for sending this one my way. From what I remember of people talking about this at around the time it was released, I think it's Cody that I specifically remember reading and enjoying this. But I think it is a YA thriller but potentially like a dark academia that really highlights and brings to light the institutionalized racism that is found within like the dark academia genre but also like academia in general. It does have content warnings in the front I just noticed when I was flicking through. It says that it includes racism, homophobia, bullying and suicide ideation so do be warned of that if you are thinking of going into this. This is another like quite a thick one. It is 400 and like 70 pages but I'm hoping that because it is a thriller it's going to end up one being really compelling and also like reading a little bit quicker than some of the fun I mean saying that I have been reading really quickly this week it this is actually no it could go either way because with it being a thriller generally with thrillers with very few exceptions when I've read them I unhaul them because I only need to read a thriller once once I know all of the twists I don't see it having any reread potential for me. So this could be one that I like read, really love, but unhaul anyway. Or this could be like a surprise five star that ends up being one of the very few thriller type stories that I actually end up keeping. Today is a very exciting day because my paint for the bedroom has arrived. This is super heavy. You should be impressed that I lifted this. But I'll show you the kind of test swatches that we did on the wall in a minute so that you can see what color we're painting things. But these actually arrived on Monday and I have blocked off the weekend to finally get this room painted. I feel like once it's painted, it's gonna like really start coming together. So I'm very excited about it. I will be painting on my own because painting is very much my forte as opposed to Curtis's. But oh, you can actually see like at the back here, this is the color that we're painting the walls. And then you can't really tell that this color here is what we're gonna be painting the skirting board. So this morning I went to the hairdressers, I got my keratin treatment redone to keep everything nice and smooth and frizz free and free of like unnecessary tangles and matting. And I've had lunch, I've made the thumbnail for this vlog actually. And now I'm gonna be in here because what I'm going to do is tidy up because there's lots of like dust and flakes of wood and coven adhesive on the floor. And I want it to be a dust free environment when I'm painting so that we're not getting like dust and dust stuff in the paint. But the color, for the walls. Yeah, so this color here is number 57, which is off black. We've gone for the estate emulsion because the bedroom is a low traffic area. It's not their most durable emulsion, but for a bedroom, it's fine. If it was like a hallway or something, I believe dead flat is the best finish to go for. And then these skirting boards are number 2011, which is blackened. And it's like a very, cool it's a white but it's almost like a very very pale gray i'll show you the test swatches because it took me quite some time to decide what color it was the white actually it was a struggle i picked the black straight away so here you have 
my test swatches. This is obviously the color of the walls. This, let me get closer. This one is the color that we've gone for, for the skirting, the ceiling, the clothing, and like the door frames. This was our other option. This one I think is shadow white. As you can see, it's a much warmer white. And in the end, we decided to go for this one because I felt like this one would end up looking dirty. It is very hard because I obviously was worried that this would be too cold for a bedroom. And I actually think like when it's on the walls, when it's on the skirting boards, you're not gonna be able to tell that it's gray but against the white, which is the color of the mist coat. I feel like it was really worrying me, but if you come down here, I did paint a little bit of the skirting board so that you could see the colors against the black of the wall. So this one is the shadow white, which was the warmer white. And this one is the gray. And as you can see where these two are next to each other, and this is next to the black as opposed to white. Can't really tell that it's like a gray. I also at some point need to get this onto Facebook Marketplace. It is the old slide tables and headboard that we had, but we're getting like a whole new bed, whole new end tables. Apart from two sets of drawers, we're getting entirely new furniture for this room because when we moved, we just took all of the odds and ends of things like from my dad's that we were already using and none of it really matches. So this room is getting like almost entirely new stuff. But in terms of reading, I actually haven't really read anything the last couple of days. I felt a little bit out of sorts yesterday, not anything drastic, but just not like 100%. And I did finish off season six of Love is Blind and I'm very upset about the finale. I cannot lie, I am devastated. Although for other reasons, I'm very happy. My overall thoughts is that I'm kind of disappointed, but I'm not too worried because even though I'm only like 40 pages into Ace of Spades and I have absolutely nothing to report so far, I'm gonna be listening to a lot of audiobook while I'm painting over the weekend. And top tip, actually, I am so happy that I found this out. A lot of my patrons recommended the audiobook for Ace of Spades. Apparently it's very, very good. It's also, it's a dual perspective book and there are two narrators. And I was looking everywhere to find it for, not for free, but like with a subscription I already have. So like it's not an Everand, it's not in the Audible Plus catalog. It's not available at my library. And I already have like a couple of audiobooks that I would like to listen to on Spotify this month. So I was kind of like resigned to just reading it physically. And then I found out that Macmillan have actually uploaded it to Spotify as a podcast. Like they've split it into parts and uploaded it as a podcast. So I can listen not only within my premium subscription, but outside of the 15 hours of audiobook listening that you get in a month if you are a Spotify premium customer. So that is very good news. And I'm very excited to crack on with that. While I'm tidying up, putting things away and cleaning in here today, I'm going to finish up that other audio book that I was talking about that I'm listening to, and then hopefully I'll be able to start fresh tomorrow with Ace of Spades. So I have already procrastinated a little bit this afternoon. It's now 2 p.m. and so I'm gonna get changed because I don't wanna clean in this and get this sorted so that I can get on with the rest of my day. It's new Fortnite season tonight as well, so I expect to be playing quite a lot of Fortnite tonight. I still can't believe that I get to see your sass from both then tonight. I swear you must have fell from the sky. And I feel so lucky I met you. So magical. The way I feel when you walk in the room. Good morning guys. It is pretty much time for me to get started. Yesterday got derailed a little bit. Curtis told me that he'd filled in like a crack on the ceiling. So I went to just like sand it down and discovered that the coven needed a lot more of the adhesive sanding off than I expected. So I cleaned this room, spent a whole lot of time sanding and then had to clean it again. And know a lot of the equipment that I put away and the rubbish. This is Curtis. I had a rubbish bin out or a rubbish box and still he cannot put the equipment that he's using in the box when he's done with it. But anyway, that aside, my first port of call is going to be to wipe down all of the coven. I'm not gonna wash the ceiling. We haven't really had greasy fingerprints on the ceiling and we didn't miscoat it that long ago. But I'm gonna wipe down all of the coven and I'm gonna start by painting the coven and doing the cutting in along the edge of the ceiling. And then I'm gonna get the roller out to do the bulk of the ceiling. I am not looking forward to it. And then tomorrow, hopefully, if I can get two coats on the ceiling today, tomorrow I will wash down the walls and then start painting those. You are gonna to have to excuse the leggings that I'm wearing today. They are significantly too big for me. But obviously, because I'm dealing with paint, I wanted to wear clothes that I don't really care about. And the, the problem with these mainly is that they do sag in some unfortunate places. So just so you know, 
I know that they look like shit, but we're doing a shitty job today. So I'm 60 pages into Ace of Spades. The audio book in total is like 14 hours. I imagine I'm gonna be able to listen to it on two times speed because the writing is quite simple. So I'm gonna go ahead and get on with that and we'll see how long it takes me. Probably I'm expecting to do this all weekend. So luckily Ace of Spades does have an audio book for me to listen to. Walking, walking, it's not optional. Gravity just pulls me right to you, to you. Mm -mm. Even the dark, they still see light. Even the birds still sing at night. Every word just comes out right when I'm with you, with you. I feel so lucky I met you, and I still. I can't believe that I get to see those eyes from more than tonight. Swear you must have felt from the sky. And I feel so lucky I met you. So it is day two of painting. I didn't quite get as much done as I wanted to yesterday because you need to leave four hours in between coats of the paint. So I did do the first coat on the ceiling which I'm really impressed because obviously fire on ball is very expensive paint I'm really impressed with the finish on this I mean for the price of it you would expect it to paint itself <laughs> but um it looks really good and honestly I have had a look over it this morning if I didn't know like if it wasn't recommended to do two coats I wouldn't say that it needs it because it's looking great but I managed to do two coats around the coven it was just the actual bulk of the ceiling that I only managed to get one coat on because I would have had to put the second coat on at like quarter past six and I wasn't prepared to do that so today I'm gonna put the second coat on the ceiling and then I'm gonna do the first coat at least on all of the walls and see what time it is like I finished and what time I can start a second coat on that although I do anticipate it might need to wait until my next free day for a second coat but I did listen to a lot of Ace of Spades last night or yesterday should I say so I'm here to give you guys a little bit of an update I'm on page 240 which is just past the halfway point I do plan to finish this today but I do have like three and a half hours of audio left to do that. So whether that is achievable, we will find out. But I have only really heard really good things about this. And with that in mind, I'm not enjoying it as much as I expected to, but I'm still having a really good time with it. So this is about two black kids that go, it's like dual perspective between them. And they go to this private school where they are the only two black people in the student body. So it's kind of Gossip Girl-esque where this person called Aces is sending messages to the entire student body saying like, I know that this person's done this with like photos and videos attached and it's getting these two characters into a little bit of trouble because one of them comes from a rich family she's half Nigerian half Italian and she's like the head prefect she's running for valedictorian all of that kind of stuff and this is really tarnishing her reputation and as somebody who doesn't come from like old American money she is going for Yale and she really needs a good reputation and a good school record to be able to get in there our other character Devon is from a rough area of town like he has two younger brothers his family aren't doing so well financially he has been involved in like drug dealing in the past his father's in prison and the only real chance that he has at a brighter future is to get into university he wants to go to Juilliard off the back of this private school so when photos start turning up like I was in him as gay and revealing his involvement in drug dealing it starts to threaten his future so these two even though they have nothing in common aside from that they are both black and both attend this school team up to try and find out who aces is and to take them down and as they're trying to find out the connection like why is this person targeting both of us and nobody else they start to think that this attack may be racially motivated it is not as spicy as i expected it to be with the amount of love that this book gets i expected it to be pacier like more on the edge of my seat the entire time i'm reading it and that is not necessarily the case i would say that it reads more like a YA contemporary than a thriller. It's like reminds me a lot of things like The Heat You Give, like it really dives into the personal lives of these characters as opposed to just the situation that they're in in school, like trying to figure out who this person is. There are some mysteries going on about like some of the incidents that these characters were involved with that they are potentially scared of being revealed that is interesting to me and I want to get, like, get to the bottom of that. And I do have a couple of theories potentially of what could be the situation here now I'm, I'm not in any position to 
know whether my predictions are right or not yet but I do feel like there's potential that it is heading that way I won't tell you what my prediction is in case it is true because I don't want to like spoil it and you go in like knowing that but at the end I'll let you know whether I was right about what I kind of think is going on here so I do think that my experience with this book has been elevated by the fact that I'm painted because this is super super easy to listen to and it is compelling enough that it's making time pass while I am painting so I feel like this was a perfect time to listen to this and it doesn't like it's a very long book but when you're listening to it it doesn't start to feel tedious like if this was high fantasy I couldn't listen to like three hours at once because my brain would start turning to soup so I feel like it is a very good option to listen to while you're occupied and also I do feel like I would recommend the audiobook because I feel like the writing is quite simple once again quite YE contemporary not that that's a bad thing it's just for me that's not what I typically read anymore so it's not a writing style that I find particularly engaging at this stage in my life and I feel like the audiobook narration with it being dual perspective with two narrators as well really brings the text to life fingers crossed I'll get that done some way today. I'm anticipating it taking 45 minutes to an hour for me to get the coat on the ceiling and then um, probably about two hours because this is a big room. This is why it took us so long to want to do this room because it is 19.8 linear meters. Like every, these two walls here are almost five meters. They're like 4.8 meters each. And these two walls are like four meters long. Like this is the biggest room in the house. And I never wanted to do it because I knew it would be expensive because every like the carpet's gonna cost a lot because the room is huge. And also like it's a lot of work because it's so big. And also I knew that this room needed a lot of work on it. Like we had to replace all the plaster because we've had damp in here when we needed to fix the roof and like from before we lived here as well. So um, yeah, I'm glad that it's finally getting done, but it is like uh, the mammoth task that I kind of expected it was gonna be as well. It's 20 to 6, so I've been in here for about 7 hours, but I have done the first coat of the paint. It looks so good. I'm so happy with it. I was worried that because the light that comes into here is kind of weak, it's kind of cold, it's morning light, it's a, it's like a northeast, I think, facing window. Or like it would be really depressing when what I'm going for is like cozy but I'm really happy with it. Like you cannot fault the finish on Far On Ball. The ceiling looks so good. The walls already with just one coat on are so rich. So I'm real happy about that. But yeah, it took a long, long time. The cutting in was a nightmare. I have bits that I definitely need to patch up, but we'll deal with that a little bit later in the week. I did also finish my book, but I'm gonna go get cleaned up and I'm gonna make dinner and I'll check in with you guys, let you know my final thoughts on the book and what we're doing about it, either later on this evening or tomorrow, depending on how my evening pans out. Good morning, guys. Last night I had dinner, I had a beautiful dessert, and then I played Fortnite until I went to bed, and I slept in for an extra couple of hours to recuperate from all of the painting that I did over the weekend. But now I'm ready to talk to you about Ace of Spades, which I did finish during the painting process yesterday, I actually painted so long that I listened to this book in its entirety across the two days and also like 70 pages of a, a different book. This one, I I gave it like a very low four star, like it, it's just on the boundary of a four. I feel like a, a 3.5, like a very high three would be a very accurate rating for this one for me because I definitely enjoyed the experience of listening to this, but I definitely feel like my enjoyment was enhanced by the audiobook and also by the fact that I was painting because this writing is very simple. Like it very much reads like a mid YA contemporary 
which is fine because that's what it is but the audio narration really brings the text to life and it's quite simple within the writing which means that listening to this while I was painting was the perfect activity because it was never so complex that I couldn't follow it while I was painting but it was gripping enough that it kept me distracted and like entertained the entire time that I was painting. In terms of the plot and the themes of this, this got way more sinister than I expected it to. I did not predict what was going on here. Like I was very <laughs> surprised when it was actually shortly after I checked in with you guys yesterday morning. Like I feel like the entire book changed. And I don't think that some of the elements in here are wholly realistic, which took me out of this a little bit. I feel like the scale on which this plot operates was a little bit hard for me to actually believe. And we also had like fitting in with the way that this plot plays out. We had characters in here that completely changed character throughout this. So at the beginning, they seem like kind of regular decent people and there's kind of no progression. It's just in the second half, a switch flips and they're completely different people. And it just felt very unrealistic to me that a couple of these characters could pretend to such a convincing degree that the main characters never suspected anything going on up until this plot starts to unravel. But obviously going into this, like I knew that the main theme of this book was going to be institutionalized racism. And I do feel like what Farida BK IMI Day has done with this is dramatize realistic incidences and blown them up onto such an epic proportion to kind of really highlight her point. But I do also feel like in doing that, the point feels a little bit, not patronizing, but a little bit too obvious. Like I feel like it lacks subtlety within highlighting that point. I did definitely enjoy my experience of reading this but I didn't love it as much as I expected it to based on other people's reviews. I do still think that it was really good and if you do want to read this would definitely recommend going the audiobook route. So in terms of my verdict and what I'm doing in regards to the challenge I am going to be on haul in this one because like I said great experience but I really don't have any need to keep it now that I've read it. Which brings us quite neatly to the end of our second episode of Shelf It or Scrap It. Just a little bit of a conclusion, a little bit of a wrap up because this was a very successful round, I feel. We had some variety in my, ver not in the books that we chose. The random number generator very much had a theme in mind and it was definitely YA paperbacks, but we had some variety in my opinions on the books and like what I wanted to do with them. And while I only read three books in this video we actually managed to get five out of the stacks and onto the shelves or into my unhaul pile and out of the five books in this video I did manage to shelve two of them I unhauled three two of which I read and one of which I decided to DNF very early on. So down in my comments, let me know what you guys thought of episode two or shelf it or scrap it. I hope you guys are still continuing to enjoy this project. And I hope that the little bit of extra variety we got in this episode helped to illustrate kind of like some of the other ways in which this project can work. Now it is gonna be very exciting because we are currently at 72 books in the stacks, but the next video that I'm going to film for my channel is going to be my self-destructing books for 2024 which is where I take 10 books from my shelves that I'm not too sure about that I'm thinking that I might unhaul and I give them a 12 month period and if I haven't read them in 12 months I have to unhaul them. So what that is going to mean is that I'm going to be taking 10 books out of the stacks potentially but predominantly I feel off my shelves and setting them aside on one of my book carts which means that I'm then going to be filling those gaps with books out of these stacks. So while we are currently at 72 books I anticipate us being a little bit lower because I I'm gonna have also an unboxing as well I imagine in that time but I imagine we're gonna have a few less books in the stacks by the time we start episode three and we are currently ending episode two on. So let me know how you enjoyed this project down in the comments guys and aside from that please don't forget to like this vlog if you liked it and subscribe if you wanna and I will see you guys next month with a brand new episode. Bye! Oh, you bite your friend like chocolate. You say you're a go where nobody knows With guns hidden under our petticoats We're never gonna quit it, no, we're never gonna quit it, no